the lifetime prevalence of migraine in people with epilepsy is 52% higher than in people without epilepsy. Could that migraine that you've had be actually an epileptic seizure? Or vice versa, might the epileptic seizure that you've had actually be a migraine? The thought of such confusion or even potential misdiagnosis can sound a bit scary, but today we hear more about the similarities between migraine and the epilepsies, including the pathophysiological and clinical overlaps and the treatments with our fabulous return guest, epileptologist and neurologist, Lucas Orellana. If you're new and you haven't done so already, please do like and comment on this episode and subscribe to our channel so that we can get way more people around the world learning about and developing a fact actual understanding of the epilepsies. I'm an adult neurologist and epileptologist uh, based in Buenos Aires and I'm currently working in the epilepsy section of uh, Shona Salk Institute and Luis Pasteur Institute in Buenos Aires. One of the reasons we can keep chatting all the time is because we talk about uh, things that often people don't necessarily associate with the epilepsy. So today we're going to be talking about migraine in epilepsy. Could you give us a bit of info about that, please? At first glance, migraine and epilepsy seem to be two neurological distinct conditions, but research evidence suggests that they have many, many things in common, uh, such as their pathogenic mechanisms, their pathophysiology, their genetics, and also their treatments. So many, many features that uh, are in common between these two entities. We can uh, talk a little bit about the epi epidemiology first, because it's really important to, to know that before talking about that, because around 1% uh, of the population might have uh, migraine. Uh, but the interesting thing here is to say that the lifetime prevalence of migraine in people with epilepsy is 52% higher than in people without epilepsy. So that is significant, especially uh, in women, uh, that usually women have uh, much more prevalence of migraine globally than men, but that uh, percentage, is, percentage is also uh, seen in people with epilepsy. Um, probably the clinical features uh, of migraine in people with epilepsy may vary, it's very heterogeneous. They could be temporarily unrelated to the epileptic seizures, but sometimes, and interestingly, uh, they are um, related to the seizures uh, and they could be classified as pre-ictal, ictal, and post-ictal headache seizures, uh, depending on uh, if they, 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 they occur before, during, or after an epileptic seizure. So there is a strong relationship, even though uh, not only talking about the prevalence, the incidence of migraine in people with epilepsy, and vice versa, because that there is a higher prevalence of epilepsy in people who suffer from migraine as well. Right. So there's a huge connection between these two entities. And um, the clinical features are a little bit, uh, have a lot of variations, but we're always talking uh, about the same thing. Okay. There's an, a, a big overlap, epidemiological overlap between these two entities. So we're thinking that they could, they could potentially have the same uh, um, genetic causes or triggers. I've heard that sometimes clinicians might not be sure if a migraine aura is in fact an aura or uh, epileptic focal seizure. Is that right? Sometimes it's really difficult to distinguish them clinically because there the are features, motor symptoms, visual symptoms, sensitive symptoms are part by sometimes are uh, practically the same okay mm. um there might be some slight di differences that could help the clinician with a good eye and um, uh, to distinguish them but for instance one of the biggest difficulties is to distinguish between a visual migraine aura which is the probably the most common mm. uh, aura in people with migraine uh, it's up to 20% of people with migraine uh, could suffer from visual auras and distinguish that from a visual epileptic focal seizure. Sometimes the duration of these two events, the speed of 
progression of the symptoms and the regression of the symptoms could be some clinical features, different, different clinical features that could help us distinguish between one from the other. But sometimes video EEG, EEG is sometimes the only way that we could, um, uh, firmly distinguish that. But I think that the clinical sense is the most, uh, important in the context, of course. Yeah, context is huge. Um, but, but that, that must be even harder, I think, to distinguish if a person does have an epilepsy and experiences migraines. And sometimes, I mean, I always think, gosh, am I experiencing a seizure right now? Or is this just the most awful, awful migraine? Maybe you don't know. And maybe the clinician doesn't know. And, and then sometimes I imagine, I mean, I'm just putting it out there, but what if a person experienced migraines and you might have a clinician who said, oh, that's a type of focal seizure? And it's not. It's migraines alone. Um, it must get very confusing, I think. An exhaustive uh, medical history, uh, I think it's the, the, the most important thing in this and to listen to the patient, um, uh, listening to what uh, the patient feels uh, about these symptoms, the frequency, um, the, the, all, all the characteristics that the, the patient in their own words could help, uh, really could help us to help us distinguish between them. We're talking about like the clinical overlap. Could you just go into a little bit of detail about the cause of hyperexcitability, if it's to do with, you know, anything like, I don't know, glutamate or, you know, all that, all that cool stuff. The pathophysiological aspects in migraine and epilepsy have a very um, strong overlap due to a pathophysiological um, background that has many, many things in common. Um, I think that I would say that the neuronal hyperexcitability may be the principal feature in these two entities, migraine, both migraine and epilepsy. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, and that could be due to an imbalance of uh, an ion imbalance, uh, an imbalance of uh, neurotransmitters. We have the glutamate, that is the positive hyper excitability uh, neurotransmitter and GABA, which is the most inhibitory or the principal inhibitory neurotransmitter. So always we have to have a balance to make things go well. Okay. But when there is, yes, when there's a disorder of that balance, well, we start to have an, uh, some kind of um, troubles and attacks probably due to this imbalance, because that leads to a lot of metabolic disorders uh, such as uh, problems with calcium, uh, sodium, uh, among others, okay? And again, which can be related to the epilepsy as well as migraine. Yes. I understand the treatments for epilepsy and migraine can be really similar too. Due to these pathophysiological uh, similarities, um, many people uh, who suffer from epilepsy and migraine uh, should be um, given medication that in case they are they, they need it um, that could help us to prevent migraine attacks and also epileptic seizures and topiramate and valparate are both uh, approved by the F fda uh, as preventive treatments uh, for both migraine and of course they are anti-seizure medications so the, the the good thing about is that if you are treating a patient who suffers from migraine and has epilepsy, okay, uh, let's make a rational therapy to avoid polytherapy, okay? Mm. So a good idea is to use medications that could be helpful for both conditions. And in this case, topiramate and valparate might be the most uh, recommended for that purpose. At least initially, I suppose. Totally, they are at least the the the, the first approved for for that, uh, but that would depend on the characteristics of the patient and many other comorbidities that the patient would have. But and then the side effects as well, right? Of of these totally, drugs. totally, because it's also good to remark that some anti seizure medications could lead the patient um, into headaches. So Great. it's an adverse effect. <laughs> so, <How ironic>. yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's really important that we can uh, see all these adverse effects that uh, the use of drugs should be uh, really um, personalized 
to the patient history, to the patient comorbidities, and of course, to the pre- to the preferences of the patient, of course, as well. Mm-hmm. Looking at overall quality of life, I guess, at the end of the day. As you mentioned, the quality of life, and as you always mentioned that, it's really important. I want to focus this to emphasize that we have to look beyond the seizures. So migraine is one of the um, most common complaints of uh, people with epilepsy. We have to, to, to listen to the patient, to listen if the, to ask the patient if he, if, if that patient has migraine. Okay. Because, uh, it's sometimes under, under-reported. Under-asked, under-reported, mm-hmm. well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably because uh, clinicians don't ask, uh, properly this question. What are our conclusions here then? What what is what have you got any takeaway messages for for our listeners at all, whether they be a person with epilepsy, mum or dad, or a clinician or researcher? Do we need more research into this? Totally, because many, 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 uh, many things are still uh, not completely understood. Uh, we have some background ideas, but. This is like the basis uh, for many, many uh, follow-up studies because we have to completely understand. There is undoubtedly uh, an overlap and relationship between these two entities. Uh, they are not exactly the same, but uh, they are not totally different. Okay, so there's a, a clinical uh, genetic uh, overlap between these two syndromes. I think that the, the key points are uh, listening closely to the patient Ask the patient if uh, that patient suffers from headaches and try to do a complete medical history of that to, to, to listen really carefully to the characteristics of uh, their headache complaint. Uh, try to choose medications and that, that could help us for, for both conditions and be rational with the use of medications not only see, okay, I'm controlling the seizures and controlling the headache, but also is the patient accordingly tolerating this medication because everything counts at the hour of uh, having uh, a good quality of life in the patient. And so also, I, I imagine, look for correlations, right, between seizure activity and migraine, and then see, you know, when you look at their their lifestyle, does it correlate to when they don't get enough sleep or they're too stressed out at work or all these different things? It's looking beyond the initial symptoms, right? Triggers are really uh, share many similarities, or uh, at least what patients with migraine and epilepsy report, uh, sleep, and uh, sleep disturbances and stress are the most important triggers for both conditions. And sometimes menstruation as well, actually. That's another one, isn't it? Hormonal aspects are well as another trigger, totally. Cataminial epilepsy, cataminial migraines are extremely uh, common. So the good thing is that if we uh, make good health improvements in the daily life, because this is like daily life um uh, habits are, or things that we do daily. If we improve those, uh, factors, those, those aspects, uh, probably we are going to have an improvement, uh, both for the epilepsy and migraine. So the good thing is that, uh, that effort that, uh, the patient does every day of their lives, um, is not only good for their general quality of life, but also for the control of seizures and migraine attacks. This was a really cool topic. Thank you so much, Lucas. Migraines and seizures can each be debilitating, and so a far improved understanding of each and their links between one another is definitely required. Learn more about Lucas and his work on the website torierobinson.com where you can access this entire podcast, including the video and the transcription of the episode, all in one place. And if you're new and you haven't done so already, please do like and comment on this episode and subscribe to our channel so that we can get way more people learning about and having a better, indeed a factual understanding of the epilepsies around the world. See you next week.